this information temporarily so it can be repeated, such as remembering a phone number you see on TV. Working memory refers to the brain storing the information for the purposes of manipulating it, such as remembering a set of numbers while working on a math problem. And when psychologists talk about improving memory, they most commonly focus on working memory because you have most control over it and can actively improve your working memory. That is very, very important, okay? Very important. So, so the memory lanes contain files which memories when stored and learning happens when the neurons in the brain communicate each with each other. Learning how, how does it work? Information enters through the brain stem, it goes to the thalamus, which sorts it out, travels to the hippocampus, organizes it, goes to the short-term memory. If connections are made to other memories, then it goes to your working memories. I'm talking about spirituality. Through more connections over time, uh, information travels to your long-term memory. That is very, very important, okay? So short-term memory, short-term memory versus working memory. Short-term memory lasts only for a few seconds. Maximum information in your short-term memory is about seven items. Your working memory lasts for a few hours and it leads to information being stored in your long-term memory. That's very important tonight. I'm gonna to skip over that a little bit. And now, so um, long-term memory and the five memory lanes, how it works. And we're gonna connect this to the, going back to the theology soon and integrate. So the long-term memory is stored forever. So learning has to follow certain lanes for it to be permanent. There are five lanes that learning has to follow for it to be permanent. Semantic lane, episodic lane, procedural lane, the automatic lane, and the emotional lane. It has to follow these five lanes if we are going to be permanent. And we're going to receive the latter reign of the seal of God uh, our memory has to employ to invoke these five lanes as relates to the work of sealing and settling into the truth uh, spiritually and intellectually so that we can't be moved. We have to take the engraving or the imprint of the image of God, of the character of Christ on our frontal lobe and every other facet of our brain and the semantic, episodic, procedural, automatic, and emotional realms as well. Now, long-term memory and five memory lanes, the semantic lanes um, stored in the hippocampus, it's a file cabinet for organizing. Uh, information learned from words, takes several repetitions for learning to occur, can hold unlimited amount of information. That's the semantic uh, lane, okay? The episodic lane. Secondly, stored in the hippocampus, file cabinet, organizer, deals with location. Where you learn the information is important to making a memory and reaching the long-term memory. So where you learn the truth, the environment, the atmosphere, the emotive, the cathartic, the energy, the spirituality, and recalling where you sat, where it was written on the board or on the book, and what place were you at when you learned the truth? Or the truth, okay? So procedural lane uh, is your muscle memory and your cerebellum uh, is used for these memories. And memory is stored when it becomes routine, brushing your teeth, riding a bike, tying your shoes, 
it allows us to do two things at once because we use different parts of the brain. And goofy body movement, uh, dances to help recall information, is very important to that as well, okay? Next, um, the um, automatic link, stimulus automatically triggers, triggers the recall of the memory. It's located in the cerebellum. Instant, ABC, math fact, sight words, song, opposite. Uh, just informative, trivial. But it can trigger other lanes to open up recall and learning. That's the important thing. So the emotional lane is open through the amygdala, the most powerful kind of memory. Stress hormones can make it, make it impossible to recall memories and learning. This is why God says all through the Bible, fear not, fear not. Don't worry. Don't let this cortisol, the stress hormones, flood your brain because it's going to destroy your memory. And another lane can trigger emotional memory, um, which can stop the memory process, okay, so that, that stress. So when memories are stored, more than one memory lane, they become more powerful. Learning memory. The more memory lanes we use to store information, the more powerful the learning becomes. Every day our brain prunes away our neural connections that are not being used, uh, even though those brain cells are still active. The brain just keep pruning them away. Just saying, well, you're not using them. You're going to discard them. That's very, very important. So long-term memory is a permanent bank, which the brain wants. Um, once a memory strive arrives at the long-term brain uh, memory, the mind stores it completely and indefinitely. In truth, uh, it's not the case, although. Long-term memory process allows information to remain in the brain for an extended period of time. Nothing in the brain um, avoids risk. Information stored in that long-term memory can be stay in the brain for a short while, a day, a week, or last for a lifetime. And when long-term memories form, the hippocampus retrieve, retrieve the information from the working memory and begin to change that brain physical neural wiring, changing it. And the new connections between the neurons and the synapse stay as long as they remain in use. So the new neurons, the new information will stay in the synaptic junction, in the synapse, for as long as the neurons are being used and their memory uh, it will remain in use. And psychologists divide long-term memory into two length types, recent and remote. Long-term memory can be described as the nature of the memory themselves. Uh, you can remember the implicit memories automatically like driving a car. Uh, you are aware actively of trying um, to remember explicit memories. And these can further be divided into episodic memories of contain events that happen at an individual specifically. Uh, semantic memories contain general knowledge as well. We're moving. So this critical factor of encoding. So it stays in the long term. The relationship of in common data, uh, in common to pre-existing mental frameworks. So, so um, somehow your brain is trying to say tonight, what's the What's the pre-existing cognitive mental framework to this idea of how we learn and how we remember and the connection to the self? So the more associations are made with established learning, the better new information is retained. The more associations are made with established learning, the better new information is retained. So you can see why in our denomination, no one remembers um, the 2300 days Daniel 7 and 8, investigative judgment, sanctuary message, the market. Why? Because there are no associations to be made with the established learning unless you're in um, a present truth environment. Okay. So the information is retained. And memories are not stored in a single location. They're complex neural networks spread through the entire brain surface, OK? And remember, we said it can disappear in 48 hours. So we want to move on now. I don't want to get too much into that. I want to come back to that area, how the Bible uses the word. So human labor. So, so we want to apply this. Is an imitation 
of and participation in the creative work of God. And fulfilling human, la human labor has the same structure as God's creative work. When we work, whatever job you're called to, it is an invitation of and a participation in the creative work of God. And fulfilling human labor, when you fulfill the network, has meaning, its purpose, uh, has the same structure as God's creative work to some degree. What does it mean? In, in your work, if you're an engineer, if you're a mathematician, if you're a scientist, if you're a, a, a carpenter, you take hold of the principles of being a carpenter, of a farmer, you tear those principles apart, you reassemble them and give them a new meaning and name. And then you evaluate the product of your labor if you grow corn, uh, if you make tractors, if you make computers, if you're an engineer, a software engineer, <clears throat> you're taking hold of the principles of physics. And uh, fulfilling labor has its goal, tell us, it's in the Sabbath today. So Exodus 31, 17. Now Exodus 25 through 31, there are seven speeches. Uh, seven is, uh, and the seventh speech is Exodus 31, 12 through 17. The seventh speech is about Sabbath, okay? And it says, if you die, if you don't keep the Sabbath, verse 17 says, look at Exodus 31, 17. Please read that in your spare time. It says that after God had created everything, he was refreshed. Now this noun um, refreshed, uh, he was nefesh, is given as a verb only three times. And on Sabbath, God says he was re-self. His self was depleted in the process of creation. In other words, he too took hold of his own laws he had created for the atoms and the cosmos. And neurons, and then he broke them apart so he could make Adam and Eve. And then the Bible says somehow another, he was reset when Sabbath came himself. Can't explain it, don't understand it, but let's pray about it. We'll work with it. So society want us to be completed selves or depleted rather, to be easily duped. Nefesh is the blood verb for reset, but. Nefesh means to take a breath, disconnect electronically from sports. You're, you're when we're depleted, we're good consumers, we're good slaves, we're good subject, we're vassal when we're under duress. But the external forces imposing behavior upon us and, and Sabbath regenerate neighborliness. I'm being kind to my neighbor. So it's an island in time. Keeping the Sabbath holy involves separating it from all other days. That's that four pathway, five pathways to memory, the episodic, auto, automatic, procedural, uh, which are characterized by the activities of work, productivity, servitude to others. So it's an island in time, removed from the mainland of the rest of the week. We in that island, we on an island. So the the junction to make Sabbath a place and time also reminds us that not all time is our time. The God of all time retains the right to determine how one day should be used. And the sense of the Sabbath as a grace, as a gift to us, is also manifest in Jesus' statement that the Sabbath was made for human beings and not human beings for the Sabbath. So God built the working or rest rhythm of the week into the fabric of creation. It is ordained into the very fabric of creation that the world is not a place of endless productivity, ambition, or anxiety tonight. Because the Sabbath is built into the very fabric of creation to keep Sabbath is to maintain the order of the universe and violating the Sabbath is to decline into chaos and has cosmic consequences. Why is the world in tumult and upheaval, catastrophic, cataclysmic? Because 
is violation of the rhythm, the fabric, and the framework of Sabbath rest in creation today. And it is this order that governs the universe, the rhythm of the universe today. And when it's violated, um, we decline into chaos, anarchy, tyranny, exploitation, manipulation, and it has cosmic consequences today. We'll move into it. So the Exodus and uh, the fourth. So the Exodus version of the fourth commandment notes four and six days. Uh, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in the mills, and Yahweh Elohim, he rested. Um, the seventh day, therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, Sabbath day, he hallowed it. Therefore, keeping Sabbath then is also remembering creation, acknowledging that the world is not ours. And you didn't do it. Deuteronomy 8 says that your own strength, your own power did not uh, facilitate, equip, and endow you with the ability to generate, tame to a claim to the stature where you are in life. God did it for you. So God is the Lord and creator of the universe. We must serve God. Sabbath as remembrance of Exodus from Egypt. That's, that is couched in that language, very much so. And the Deuteronomy version of the Sabbath urges us to remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt and the Lord brought you out from where there were mighty hands Outstressed arm, therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So what is the Sabbath? It is a reminder of every man's world and the abolition of the distinction between master and slave, rich and poor, success and failure. But to celebrate Sabbath is to experience one's ultimate independence of civilization and society. Of achievement and anxiety, the Sabbath is the embodiment of the belief that all men are equal and that equality means nobility of all men. And the greatest sin of man is to forget that he is a prince. So the intention, the intention then, seems to be that Adam was to widen the boundaries of the garden in an ever increasing circles by extending the order of the Garden of Eden where he dwelt, that God made for him, which was the holy place. And the Western part of the garden would have been the most holy place where God was intended to dwell forever with his creation. And that's why the New Jerusalem is shaped just like the most holy place in the Garden of Eden today. So, Garden of Eden uh, is God's many micro uh, sanctuary. And the outward expansion would include the goal of spreading the glorious presence of God today. That, that's what the goal is. That's what we are to do, go beyond the confines, the domains of the sanctuary on Sabbath and increase God's presence into our community and the world we live in tonight. So here in this numerical image is one, Genesis one, uh, and God said 10 times, let there be order eight times. The fulfillment formula, it was so seven times. In other words, this was sung. Uh, execution formula, a description of an act, a, example, and God made seven times. Um, five approval formula, God saw it was good, okay? Seven times. And six, subsequent divine word, even naming or blessing, seven times. And mention of days, seven times. So you can see this formula, seven times, seven times. Uh, when God gives these different formula in the creation of the world. So when we enter the seventh day Sabbath rest, um, we recall what the intended purpose of creation was and is. And the purpose is for the creator to be at rest with his creation, 
We also renew our hope of a better tomorrow and the recreation and reperfection of the earth made new in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. So the very content and structure of Genesis 1 through 3 is in a very literal sense a worship, the seventh day creation's high point. And the second verse, we find 14 words, seven times two. It was sown. Furthermore, the significant word in the passage occur in multiples of seven. God, 35 times, that's seven times five. The earth is Genesis one and two. Um, seven times three, heaven and the firmament, 21 times. And it was so, seven times. God saw that it was good seven times. This heptadic structure, it, 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 it denotes of this sevenfold uses for accentuating, highlighting something that is definitive, that's authoritative, that is very important. That's why God has this seven or 21. That's three times seven. He has this rhythm, this heptadic structure in the Sabbath in Genesis 1 and 2. To, to remember um, what God want us to do, okay? It's very important, all right? Very, very important. Now we're moving on to this. So when we enter the seven-day Sabbath, we recall that purpose of creation and the Sabbath point forward to the recreation and the hope of glory where everything will be reperfected again. We miss that point sometimes. We miss it a lot. Um, it, it's just too unfortunate. So the goal of redemption is to restore in man the image of God, uh, body, mind, and spirit, so that the creator can be at rest in communion, repose with his creation. The atonement sacrifice of Christ is a love story between the creator and the creation tonight. Let me clarify how this works. When we stop working on the sixth day and we keep the Sabbath holy, unless your, your medical field or whatever demands it, um, it, the correspondence and corollary is we cease work from saving ourselves and we rest in the blood of Jesus to save us through faith his atonement sacrifice. And this is the love story between the creator and his creation. This is righteousness by faith is at the heart of the Sabbath. When we stop working on the sixth day and keep the Sabbath from sunset to sunset, it corresponds or correlation or escalation is we cease from any work to save ourselves and we rest in the blood of Jesus, the atonement sacrifice of Christ. That's what Sabbath symbolizes. And we, we miss that point sometimes. So Adam wants to lay hold of the cosmos. We have a few minutes left. Before working with that, Adam wants to give thanks to God for his gift of the cosmos. Adam wants to break down and restructure the portion of the cosmos within his grasp. He would give new names as a result to, okay? Here are the possible four rivers that came from the Western part and flowed through Eden as one river. And then as it flows through Eden, outside it becomes four distinct rivers, the Tigris, the Euphrates, Gishon, Pishon. These are the four rivers that watered the whole world that came from one river head in the western part of the garden. What a God we serve. What a great God we serve tonight. And that is important. Now, we, we're supposed to guard and serve. That's what Adam's job was. God stamped uh, Lucifer's raw countenance with the signet of perfection, just like Adam, or the resemblance. Verse 12. Um, as a symbol elsewhere associated with his raw likeness and authority. Genesis 41, Haggai, 
Jeremiah 22, 24, and, and, and the king uh, is clothed in the same precious stones, this is Lucifer before he fell, worn on the breastplates of Israel's high priest. The same type of stone we found in Havilah, one of the lands watered by the rivers flowing from Eden. Look at Ezekiel 28, 13, Exodus 28, 17, 20, and Genesis. So this is talking about Lucifer's fall. As the king creation is described in Adamic uh, and priestly terms, so his sin is characterized as a form of sacrilege, talking about Lucifer. Uh, profanation, he's punished by exile and deconsecration. The king's sin, like Adam, is grasping after divinity. This is what Adam wanted to be divine. Um, wanted to be like a god. And, and this becomes the refrain of Ezekiel's indictment. Compare Genesis 3, 5, 22, Ezekiel 28, 2. This Lucifer's sin was he wanted to be a god, a god-like, if, if, if at all. And in the second creation account, in Genesis 2, 3, the Garden of Eden is described in highly symbolic terms as an earthly sanctuary, again, with evident parallel of later sanctuaries, okay? Especially the inner sanctuary or sanctum of the temple. So driven by cherubim, he is, Lucifer is cast from the presence of God as someone that's profane, who had desecrated God's sanctuary, Ezekiel 28. Look at Genesis 3. And there may be an allusion to the curse of Adam and the kings being turned to ashes upon the earth. So this passage in Ezekiel 28 suggests that already within the Old Testament, there was a traditional understanding now of the human person as created in relationship with God and endowed with an identity that is royal and priestly, phileo and liturgical, or to worship God. We were created to worship. It's very, very important to them, okay? And through their work, um, through their work, Adam and Eve, they were to bring creation to its fulfillment, to complete God's work by making the world a whole, in which they could dwell with him and live as his people, and all of creation is ordered to the covenant. Um, the familiar dwelling place of God with his people. So the Sabbath is a sign of God's perpetual covenant, Exodus 31, 16. It is meant to be a living memorial of the original perfection and intention of God's creation, his desire to rest in communion with his creation. That's what the Sabbath is. It's a desire for God to rest. It's symbolic, it's emblematic, it's, it's pictorial, it's prophetic that God will once again rest in communion with his creation. What a God we serve. So the term of relationship, of human relationship with God, um, are ordered by the covenant of the Sabbath, established on the seventh day. Uh, this becomes clear. The term covenant, of course, is not used in the creation account. However, that creation is ordered to be a covenant everywhere. We don't see covenant written there in Genesis 1 and 2, but it's implied. The Sabbath orders humans from work to worship. I'll say that again. The Sabbath orders humans work from work to worship, labor to liturgy, the royal calling to subdue the earth that's what our goal is, finds its expression in the liturgical consecration that on this day, man must recognize the enthroned Lord of hosts who having completed his work awaits in the attitude of majestic repose, the liturgical, the worship response of his creation or creature today. The creation is the first action in the history of salvation. Once it's over, God stopped work 
he was then able to make a covenant with his creature and creation. The sign of the covenant was made at the dawn of creation is the observance of the Sabbath by his creature and creation, Ezekiel 20, 12. It's a sign. So even the Catholic ministerial documents have referred to the Sabbath of creation as the first covenant. John Paul saw that. This dominant in his apostolic letter. By the way, we're told that one of his family members, John Paul, was a Seventh day Adventist. This gentleman, Ross, a theologian, he says that Genesis 2.15, we're getting there, almost there. Uh, Genesis 2.15 begins with this concise and re precise report that Yahweh put man in a garden. The bird put, cast the tone for the visual texture of the text. The verb put in verse 8 of Genesis 2 is a different word. The verb used in verse 8 was sim, like the sim card. But in Genesis 2.15 is nuach, to set to rest. So the biblical use of nuach, if you want to know <clears throat> this, this understanding of nuach, so the biblical nuach is often associated or equated with the main word for rest, shabbat, shabbat. So the Bible says the disobedient Israelites were not permitted to enter into Yahweh's rest, Psalms 95, 11. So the book of Hebrews says there remains, there remains a Sabbath rest, a Sabbatismos uh, to the people of God. Our time, we're rounding third. So the noun rest, nuach, menuach, is also used in description of the sanctuary of the Lord as his resting place, Psalm 132, 14. Avad, the B is V in the Hebrew, and Samar, respectively, can also be rendered serving, worshiping, guarding, and protection. And so Adam and Eve were put into the garden uh, with this idea of Abad and Samar. It means serving, worshiping, guarding, and protecting. But what, 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 how? We want to explain that. So the first verbs, work and take care, of, are used in the Old Testament. The first verb, work, doesn't. Does the work serve is a vibe. So when God says you put in the garden to work, it's a vibe. And a vibe is frequently uh, used for spiritual service, especially to the Lord in Deuteronomy 4, 19. A vibe is used for the duties of the Levite, Numbers 3, 7 through 8, 4, 23, 24, 26. Throughout the Bible, a devout person is called a servant of the Lord of Yahweh tonight. We're getting there. We're getting there. So for our reading of this, worship reading of this, these parallels, and what we need to remember, to recall, to recodify, to decode, um, is that the terms of the relationship between God and man in the garden and the sanctuary, God is described as walking up and down or to and fro in the garden in Genesis 3.8. The same Hebrew word is used, a verb, to characterize God's presence in the tabernacle. God in Genesis is described as walking up and down in the garden. And that same word is described and used as God's uh, to characterize his presence in the tabernacle in Leviticus 26, 12, Deuteronomy 23, 14, 2 Samuel 7, 6 through 7, the same verb. So the first man is described, we're almost there as placed in the garden to serve, to avoid, and to keep guard. These verbs are found only together again in the Pentateuch to describe the liturgical services of the Levites, uh, priests, and the Levites. They were put in the garden to serve and to keep guard. That's what Adam was put in, in Eve in the garden for, to serve and to keep guard. They were kingly. They were deputized kingly, priestly, vice regents of Yahweh. And that's what God is calling us to uh, again. So creation as a royal temple building by heavenly king and the human persons in this creation, Adam and Eve, in these pages are intentionally portrayed as a kind of a priest, um, king kind of, 
set to rule as the vice regent over the temple kingdom of creation. The language and the image and the likeness suggest both filial relationships and a royal delegation of responsibilities. What a God we serve today. Adam was a kingly priest, kingly priest. The Levites took on the same connotation, king, priestly. You jump fast to Revelation. It says that we're going to be priests and kings, but not kings of nations. In the redeemed world, we would be a nation of kings. Every nation of the 12 tribes would be a nation of kings. And that's the creation has come full circle. We're almost there. So compare Genesis 126 with Genesis 5.1. The kingly and the filial imagery in Psalms 8. Command to rule over creation is an important aspect of the image and likeness. So our job is to rule over creation. They offered Adam and Eve, the Levites, they offered spiritual services in the form of sacrifices and all the cultic duties of the sanctuary in the context of safeguarding God's commands and guarding the sanctuary from the intrusion of evil today. That's the Genesis narrative today. Adam and Eve were placed in the garden to serve the Lord. They were like priests and kingly and had responsibilities of all the divine intuitions of the sanctuary. And man could not perform these enormous tasks by himself. So a woman was created to be his helper and they were to serve him, a vibe in a spiritual capacity tonight. And when Yahweh redeemed Israel, he was making them kingdom of kingly priests, Exodus 19.5, royal, holy people. He was in essence making them into his functioning image on earth um, to do his will in the whole earth. However, the combination of the functioning image was restored in his son, Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.15 and 2 Corinthians. We are going to quit right here in a minute. As a result, we're closing. Similar to the Genesis creation, the Red Sea crossing is staged by a cloud and darkness, and yet the night was lighted. Look at Exodus 14, verse 20. Look, cross-reference Genesis. The sea and the waters are then divided by God's spirit and turned into dry land. Look at Genesis 1, 9 through. And it's very corresponding to the book of Genesis, what happened in Exodus. And these elements, a divine ruah, spirit, the sea, the darkness, which becomes lighted, the waters were being divided as the appearance of dry land identify Israel Exodus as a new act of creation when they walked through the Red Sea. What a God we serve tonight. And so Israel replicated, reduplicated Adam and Eve's creation narrative in Genesis 1 and 2. And just like Adam had a fall, Israel had a fall, David had a fall. Solomon has a fall. We could go on down the road, but, but then came Jesus. Uh, he did not have a fall. The last Adam did not have a fall. So they crossed through the sea from darkness to light, uh, from west to east, Exodus 14, verse 22. They emerged in the morning, verse 24, and they were freed from Egypt, who, was, who has been consumed by the waters, and do the God's antifrastic use of the sea as his creation too. Israel passage was through chaos and death today. So, but it re paradoxically it re it results in their creation of life. And God commands the water anew to give way to the dry land. We're talking about when they were now crossed a way out of Egypt, which he had destined for humanity. Uh, so humanity might fill it again. What a God we serve tonight. I'm going a step further. We'll close right here. Um, that God uses the same power he used to create the world. Israel's salvation is a new creation. Israel redemption from Egypt, Egyptian slavery is their cre creation as a new humanity and recovery of God's creational purpose today. What a God we serve today. What a God. Sabbath and the Pharaoh tried to subvert the creation work of God among the Israelites 
and the children of Israel were fruitful and abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly might. And the land was filled with them. And he said, the Lord blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Replenish the earth. Subdue it. Subdue it. Subdue Egypt. Subdue the world. Have dominion over the fish, the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God's triumph over Pharaoh was a cosmic victory over Egypt, the embodiment of the forces of chaos threatening to undo Christ's creation. Whatever is happening today, God is going to triumph once again over the forces of darkness, over all of these cataclysmic, catastrophic events that are unfolding that are tumultuous today, heart earthquake and earth shattering, pain, suffering, disease, tragedy. Father God, we pray that you will make your word clear to your people today. That Sabbath is indeed, as a reminder, we enter into a mini Garden of Eden on the Sabbath to recall the hope, what God did for this original perfection and creation, and also to recall the hope of glory as we look to the re-perfection in the Garden of Eden and the earth made new. Bless these blessed souls on here tonight, Lord, that wherever they are in the globe, I'll let them find rest in Jesus' name. And this Sabbath, in a new enlightenment, connecting these experiences to their episodic, procedural, Lord God, automatic memory, Lord God, semantic memory, declarative memory, Lord, and understand the Sabbath and creation, recreation and decreation in a new way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you don't mind, put a chat message telling me where you're from, or what city, what state, what country are you in tonight? Put a chat message in there for us to do that. Won't you do that today? Thank you so much today. All right. We are done here today. And may God bless you, keep you during this season, protect you, and I give you grace tonight. God bless. So good to see you. All right. You may log off now. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.